Tonight's presentation for our study group is the computed tomography imaging chain, and we're going to discuss the major components and their function. Now, uh, Webtrack Media Productions is the name of my company, and this presentation is also a part of the Tough Enough Bounce Back program, which is designed for uh, RTs with difficulty with the CT registry examination and are looking for some special study tips. Well, let's jump right into the, uh, the, the lecture. I've got uh, 25 slides here, but we'll probably get through about half of them. Um, the reason will become apparent here in a second. With regard to the major components of this ET imaging chain, there are approximately 10 major components, and they're listed for you there on the right. Uh, the only one that's not represented here diagrammatically would be the generator. But things begin there up at the top of the X-ray tube, progress to the generator, then to the beam shaping filter, the pre-patient collimator, and we have room there for the patient where attenuation takes place, the pre-detector collimator, the detector array, the analog to digital converter, abbreviated ADC, and then there's the CT computer, also known as the array processor, Finally, the last two components, the digital to analog converter, and then the monitor, which we use to visualize CT images. Okay, so one at a time, we'll go through the components, and we begin with the x-ray tube. Now, as I go through the lecture and we go through the slides, at certain points in time, I'm going to say test answer. And what that means is the facts that we're going to share are very important relative to a registry question, either as a question per se, or as a potential answer to a registry question. So when I say test answer, that's a particularly important time to pay attention to what's going on here with the discussion. So the x-ray tube, its, its primary purpose, what's it do, test answer? Its purpose is to convert electrical energy to electromagnetic energy. And as you know, electromagnetic energy is X radiation. So the test answer here is, what's the function of the X-ray tube in the CT imaging chain? That function is the conversion of electrical energy to electromagnetic energy. And the X-ray tube in, in, in CT, just like in diagnostic, has four major components. And they inc include the anode, which is the positive terminal, the cathode, the negative terminal, the metal envelope, which used to be Pyrex, right? And then there's the vacuum, which is a very important part of the structure of the x-ray tube. Why? Well, because of the fact that with the vacuum, as long as it's maintained, there will be an uninterrupted flow of electrons from the filament to the target in the x-ray production process. That can only happen in the presence of a vacuum. Now, in the x-ray production process, it's normal for things to get very, very hot especially at the surface of the anode. When that happens, certain impurities get liberated from the metal and that they become gaseous and they violate the vacuum eventually over time. Why that's important is if those gassy molecules become, a, how they become a factor is when the bombardment of the of the target occurs from the flow of electrons from the filament to the target. If molecules are in the way, it takes away from the energy of those projectile electrons and the beam will not be as energetic. If it happens to a great degree, we call it a gassy tube. Test answer. Gassy tube is when there are enough, a, a, when there is a lot of gas liberated from the metals because of the heat in the X-ray production process. Yeah. And in the x-ray production process, remember, there are two. There is bremsstrahlen or breaking radiation, and then characteristic radiation. The two different processes are bremsstrahlen and characteristic. The generator is the second component in the CT imaging chain. And in modern multi-detector CT, we're talking about a generator that's single phase and high frequency. Test answer. The function of the generator, it's the generator that provides the energy for x-ray production. Test answer. Two things, single phase high frequency, that's the type of generator that is used in, in modern multi-detector CT, that's a test answer. 
And the second test answer is the function of the generator is that it provides the energy for X-ray production. Now it's important to note that the generator is single phase high frequency because that type of generator has a very small voltage ripple, less than 1%. What does that mean from a practical standpoint? Look at the example down below in the black box. If 100 kVp were selected at the control console, because of the fact that the single phase high frequency generator has a voltage ripple that's less than 1%, those projectile electrons produced in the production process would bombard the target with energies from 99 to 100 kVp, almost exactly the same. That means we have the beginning of the production of a very monoenergetic beam. Why is that important? That's important because of the fact that if we have a beam that is largely of the same energy, when it interacts with the patient's body, the beam that comes from the part will then be truly reflective of the patient's anatomy. That's right. Attenuation is different in the liver compared to the vertebral column compared to the kidney, compared to the psoas muscle. You get my drift? We can totally dictate the pattern of photon energies that exit from the part if we know the energy of the beam going in. And if it's largely monoenergetic, then the thing that's going to determine the difference in beam energies that come from the part is the part itself. It's a good thing. The beam shaping filter is component number three. Test answer, its function is to harden the beam by removing low energy photons. Test answer, this will result in dose reduction by way of skin sparing. Yeah, beam shaping filter is a pretty important piece of equipment. So we've got this business going on with the generator and the production of a monoenergetic beam. And then we further shape the beam by removing low energy photons with the beam shaping filter. See, the whole idea here is to save dose. Number one, we're gonna eliminate from the photon shower those X-ray photons that never had a chance to penetrate the part. Let's get rid of them all together from the photon shower because the only other place they would be is to be absorbed within the patient's body. Nah, get rid of them. Absorb them out with the filter. And that makes the beam even more monoenergetic, which we have learned is a good thing from an imaging quality perspective. Number four, the pre-patient collimator. The pre-patient collimator controls the scan field of view as well as the Z axis. All right, the scan field of view. What are we talking about here? We're talking about that area that is within the rectangle of exposure, if it's the abdomen, let's say. And let's say it ranges from the xiphoid process to the pubic symphysis. That's one measure of the scan field of view. And then, of course, from lateral border to lateral border. That essentially will be the area that's going to be exposed when the CT tube turns in a helical arc around the patient's body. The other way that the beam is dimensioned is in the z-axis by way of slice thickness. All right, so the pre-patient collimator controls the scan field of view and is also used to control the z-axis by controlling slice thickness. That's what we're talking about with the pre-patient collimator. Pretty important piece of equipment, wouldn't you say? Because with it, we're going to limit the field that's being exposed to radiation. And by doing that, we're going to limit the amount of scatter that's produced. And by doing that, we're going to limit se severely the amount of covering up or clouding over of details that occurs when scatter radiation has an impact on an image. The patient is where attenuation takes place. And those factors that control attenuation, otherwise known as subject contrast, include four things. They are part thickness, otherwise known in the literature as exponential attenuation. And any amount of part thickness will cause attenuation to occur, no matter how thin, no matter how thick. 
The second factor that controls attenuation is part density in terms for grams per centimeter cubed. This is one you learned about in x-ray school a long time ago because chest radiography was one of the first topics you learned about in x-ray school, it wasn't it? Isn't it? Isn't that the exam where everybody starts? And what's one of the first things you learned about? Emphysema, smokers. What'd you have to do with your technique? Go down. Why? Because there was less anatomy there. The alveolar sac walls had broken down to cause huge pockets of air that are easily penetrated. So we had to go down in our technique. There was a change in part density. There was a change in the grams per centimeter cubed. What's another example? How about in the abdomen, ascites, when we have extra amounts of fluid in the abdomen and it's difficult to penetrate? My oh my, what do we do then? We have to go up in technique, but not so much as to cause an extremely long scale of contrast. Because as you go up in technique, what happens? You're going up in KVP that penetrates, so things get grayer and grayer and grayer, longer scale, longer scale, longer scale of contrast. That's part density changing. Another factor that controls attenuation is the part atomic number, the Z, the number of electrons, excuse me, the number of protons found within the nucleus of an atom of that material, like bone, bones made up of calcium. It has a different atomic number, calcium does, than hydrogen or oxygen. It happens to be higher on the scale, like 20, where oxygen is eight. The higher the atomic number, the greater the amount of attenuation. In fact, any of the first three, part thickness, part density, part atomic number, as any of those three increase, attenuation increases. Conversely, as any one of those three decrease, attenuation decreases. Now, KVP, the fourth factor that controls attenuation, is a different duck. It's opposite day. As KVP increases, attenuation decreases because the beam goes through things more equally the higher we go in KVP. The lower the KVP, the more likely it is that the beam will be differentially absorbed. Yeah. So the lower the KVP, the greater the attenuation. It's opposite day. Keep that in mind. And remember that when we talk about attenuation, the interaction events that take place within the patient's body include Compton scatter and photoelectric effect. Test answer stuff about Compton scatter and photoelectric. Here's some important facts. Compton scatter is an interaction event that occurs with outer orbital electrons, test answer. Whereas photoelectric effect is an interaction event that occurs with inner orbital electrons. You're going to be asked about that difference. That's a test answer. Component number five is the pre-detector collimator. The pre-detector collimator is responsible for controlling the beam width at the detector array by controlling the volume of the cone beam. The volume of the cone beam. Let's take a look over here at the diagram and figure out where we're at. We see we, where we are relative to the x-ray tube up above and the focal spot. And what's important about the focal spot? The focal spot's the area of x-ray production. Test answer. After the x-ray tube or outside the x-ray tube, we've got the beam shaping filter, right? Which is gonna help reduce dose to the patient and it's gonna shape the beam so we have a more monoenergetic situation for image quality and dose and, and reduce dose. Then there's the pre-patient collimator. What was important about the pre-patient collimator in particular? Wasn't it the device that controlled the scan field of view and also the Z-axis? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then inside the patient, we had the factors of attenuation. Do you remember what those four factors were? Part thickness, part density, part atomic number, and KVP. And then there's the pre-detector collimator. Here we see it after the patient. Look what's going on here. The pre-detector collimator is actually guiding the beam onto the detector system. Yeah. 
Okay. And here we've got a single detector. Well, nothing could be further from the truth than modern detect multi CT uh, today, right? Because we've got detector systems, we've got 256 detectors. I mean, 64 is pretty usual, pretty common. And now we got 128 slice systems and 256 slice systems. And here the detector array and the diagrams represented by one single detector. Oh, poor pitiful me. Also on this slide, we introduce a term called beam width. And beam width is a term that's important for you to remember because we'll use it relative to pitch. So beam width is equal to the slice thickness. That's right, the slice thickness that you might be using for the study times the number of detectors utilized. Well, that number could be variable, right? Because the number of detectors utilized could be, well, what if the system's a 16 slice system? or a 32, or a 48, or a 64, or a 128, or a 256. See how that number could vary? Whereas slice thickness may very well stay the same at three millimeters, five millimeters, or sub, or some sub millimeter level or value. Number six is the detector array. It's the detector array test answer that converts the electromagnetic energy of the exit beam into the electrical energy impulses that represent the radiologic image. Wow, pretty important job, don't you think? Converting the electromagnetic energy of the exit beam. So that's the x-ray pattern that's coming from the patient. We're going to convert that, those electrical, those, those x-ray photons into a pattern of electrical energy impulses that represent the radiologic image. We just translated the image, didn't we? With the, through the detector array. And then we have the analog to digital converter, abbreviated ADC. The analog to digital converter samples that electrical flow. Every once in a while, it takes a measure. It's every once in a while, as the electrical flow is coming across in front of it, it goes, all right, I want to measure it now, 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 now. And every time I said now, the sampling that was going on is actually a quantification of that electrical flow in very small values of amps and volts, referred to as picoamps and microvolts. Wow. So the ADC is a pretty important device. So far, it's sampled the electrical flow and then quantified the, that electrical flow in picoamps and microvolts. And then last, it codes that electrical energy, converting it to binary digit data. So whatever values in combination of a pico, a pico amps and microvolts that it realizes from a photon, it converts that to a binary digit. Uh, another translation, if you will, the analog to digital converter, where CT imaging data becomes digitized. The CT computer or the array processor test answer, its function is to reconstruct the binary data received from the ADC by way of application of various algorithms. The resultant CT numbers that occur as a result of the application of certain algorithms are plotted on a matrix through the application of filtered back projection. Yeah, here's where the rubber meets the road. Test answer stuff, A and B. And then finally, we've got the DAC, the digital to analog converter. The digital to analog converter is responsible test answer for converting the reconstructed binary data back into electrical energy impulses that can then be recognized by the monitor or some sort of display device. Okay. Yeah. Pretty interesting situation here. And it's all because of the fact that we've got a relatively outdated device here that we're talking about. The monitor that is used to display the electrical energy impulses as an image of individual pixel gray shades representing the image proper. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, those were the 10 major components associated with the CT imaging chain. Um, the CT imaging process itself, it's, well, the, it's an image creation process that can be broken down into three general segments, and there they are. Data acquisition provided by the scanner, image reconstruction provided by the CT computer, and then image display provided by the monitor. Guess what? Test to answer. And then the lecture goes on for the remainder slides with the visual CT imaging chain, which is really some pretty interesting reading. I don't think I need to go over this any long, anymore. I, I, I'd really like to listen to your questions unless, unless you want me to do some more with this. Can I hear from the group? Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, asked to unmute. Asked to unmute. Okay. Hi, Erica. Can you hear me? Hey, yes, I can hear you now. Will you be able, since you're recording this, to send us a copy? I am recording it. Will you be able to send us a copy? I do believe I will be. I, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll need to figure it out, <laughs> but I think so. The answer is okay. yes. <laughs> Perfect. I just thought it would be easier to listen to it again and take notes. You know, the first ah. time. It's always yeah, better to hear it a couple times. Sure. Sure. I'll send it. I'll, I'll send it to you. A Amy is my technical support. She will help me with this. There's a link that we'll be sending you to access the video. Okay. Do you have any questions? Rosella, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, did you have any questions? What'd you think? Um, so when you were explaining the scan field of view, mm -hmm. so the, the scan field of view versus the, I know we haven't got to display field of view, but could you explain that to me? Display field of view happens after the fact. Display field of view is like an imaging technique by comparison with scan field of view. Scan field of view we set up prior to the examination. At, scan field of view we set up after the scout has been taken, but before we push the button to actually do the scan. Um, yeah. I know that for whatever reason, a lot of sources don't make that differentiation, and a lot of people are confused about it. So that's if the display field of view is right before we actually press for the, for it to scan. No, 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 no. That's well, I did the reverse. Scan field of view. Scan field of view is accomplished after you you set up things for the scout and everything. Okay. Okay. Right. And yeah. the, and and you set up the parameters of the scan, like where it's going to start, where it's going to stop, and you and you also set up you also set up the slice thickness. Yes. All of those are scan field of view parameters. Okay. Yeah. And then display field of view happens after the data has been acquired. Okay. Display, display field of view is like going after the fact and using zoom from a camera to look at the data. Okay. 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 Two big differentiating points. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll send a link, and and and, and you'll have access to, uh, to the to the presentation. You'll be able to listen to it again. Did you want me to do some more with this, or you know, we we've been at it. It's almost a half hour. But I don't want to take up all of your time. Will you be doing this every Tuesday, or yep. on a schedule? Yep. Yep. In fact, in fact, in fact, I think in the in, in the very first email I did send a schedule, but you know what? I'll do it again. I'm sorry. I may not have gotten that. Yeah. 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 Who 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 knows? Man, the technology can can be sometimes pretty crazy. It's on Tuesdays. Is that correct? It is. Okay. It is. And it's and it's seven o'clock Pacific time. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and if you've got friends that, that 
that you know are studying that might benefit, tell them. They can join. Okay. All, I gotta, I all they need to do is send me an email and ask to join, and I'll let them in. Okay. And uh, you could do me a favor too. Uh, if, if you found that you know this this first study group was helpful, you know if you could please leave a comment on our social media page. We have a Facebook page, the toughest stuff CT re review page. If you you know go there and leave a positive comment, and maybe what some of your thoughts that would be really appreciated. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I was wondering. Um, if there was, if there's a group there, you know, where you work, you know, are trying to get this done, they're welcome. They are welcome. And pur purchase isn't, isn't necessary. Okay. Hello. We're here. I have a couple of girls at work that are going through the same thing, so I'll mention to them. Do it. I yeah. will as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I know that if you, if you've purchased the toughest stuff, if you have the webinar, um, I do have a slide. Let me look. There's a, oh, I don't know if I can get to it now. Yeah. Where'd it go? Are you there? Let's see. Uh, that, uh, this slide. So you guys need to, need to check out the second one, episodes one and two of the webinar, and then uh, look through the practice test workbook for the quizzes and exercises that are appropriate. They're marked. Then there's always the what to study slides that are part of the webinar too. And all of that will serve as really positive reinforcement for what we talked about tonight. I want to see you do well on the exam, man. That's what it's all about. I'm a teacher at heart, and I want to see you guys pass, and I want to see you get the number that you think you deserve. And if you work hard enough, that number will be high. Thank you. I need it. Welcome. Okay, you guys? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good evening. You too. See you next week. All right. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.